we are going to do a little bit of backtracking. We learned yesterday, should be another beep, we learned yesterday that in May of 1945, the Germans surrendered. They surrendered unconditionally. We learned that the last of the conferences, good morning, See any of the notes for? Parker Wideman. Parker Wideman. Where are you, Parker? We learned that in Potsdam, which is a suburb of Berlin, that the big three met. Now, it's not the big three we were using yesterday in our notes. The big three met, and they talked about war crimes. Now, obviously, the Nazis who started the war should be held accountable. But were there other crimes in Germany during the war? And the answer is yes. In 1939, the year the war broke out in Europe, we began hearing stories about Jews and other undesirables being rounded up and taken to concentration camps. Now, at first, these concentration camps were there to make things, to do work. But in 1945, as these concentration camps were being liberated, we discovered that the concentration camps were actually death camps that over six million Jews and other undesirables had been executed. As the train would come in, the undesirables and Jews would be taken off. They would be lined up. The camp leader would pick certain people. They would then go to the work side of the camp. The rest of the people, this would be the children, the old, most of the people would be sent off to the extermination site. They would be forced to take off their clothes. They would be told that next there would be a shower, a delousing. They would then be issued prison, or, you know, work clothes, and then they would go on and work. What they did not know is the shower was actually the gas chamber. Once they were dead, those people had, who had been pulled aside to work were then sent into the gas chambers to pick up the bodies. They were then taken to crematoriums where their bodies were incinerated. Now we know all of this because the Germans kept excellent records. And they waited too long to try to destroy the records once the camps were liberated. And because of this, this is all a historical fact. Now, here is a member of parliament who is going to go to one of these camps and tell moviegoers in Great Britain what she saw. Now, if any of you had Miss Kemker or Miss Jarman, you know that this summer they were invited to go to a, uh, to a thing at Auschwitz this lady here is in Buchenwald. Buchenwald is the labor camp. Auschwitz was the death camp. So what you are going to see in this video is what Miss Jarman and Miss Kemker saw this summer. a few of the sights we saw, and much as they may shock you, 
do believe me when I tell you that the reality is indescribably worse than these pictures. You cannot photograph something, only its results. In pictures you have no smell of disease and death. Here you see no more than a fragment of a full pattern of horror. When they had died, they were either burnt in these ovens or thrown like vermin into large conical pits. General Eisenhower is now giving each victim as he dies a reverend burial. Many of the mourners are very sick men. On the day before our visit, the deaths had been reduced to 35 during the day. Several nationalities and types, many of them intellectual and highly gifted men and women, were heard in, in unspeakable conditions which have entirely altered their appearance. In some camps, I'm told liberated slaves turned against their guards and attacked their quarters. Now, what is going to happen to those who survive the Holocaust? That is where we will pick it up in Lesson 27. In Yiddish, which is the language of the ancient Jew, this is referred to as the Holocaust. Now, we are unsure of the actual numbers of deaths. We know the number is north of 6 million. We know that during the trials that were held, many of the guards confessed to what had happened at these camps. These were basically crimes against humanity. Now, these crimes against humanity have no exploration date. In other words, if you get caught today and you had done these crimes, during that time period you could still be held accountable and there was a case last year where a German who came to America after the war it was discovered he was one of these guards people testified against him and now he's in jail we need to make some type of mark in our notes so that we know that we are now going to the war in the Pacific. We will start in the year 1941 with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, on the map of the Pacific, could you find Hawaii? Could you find Pearl Harbor? That seems to be a good place for us to put down one of our numbers. In December of 1941 to the spring of 1942, the Japanese are able to take Wake and Guam Island, these are U.S. territories, and then in the spring they will capture the Philippines. Now the Philippines has the largest concentration of American soldiers, American sailors, in the Pacific Theater. As these sailors and soldiers are captured. They number in the thousands. Now it is decided that they will be kept in a prisoner of war camp. Now they are marched from where they were captured to the prisoner of war camp, which is about a 80 mile march. For those who were wounded, if they fell out of line, they were simply shot. For those who became sick along the way, if they could not continue, they were shot. This has been called the Death March of Bataan. Bataan is the name of the island where most of these people will come. Now, what will happen to them next is they will be separated and taken by freighter 
to Japan, where they will work like slaves for the remainder of the war or until they die of disease. Now, prior to the loss of the Philippines, Douglas, Command Douglas MacArthur, who was the commander of all American troops in the Philippines, made the statement over the radio that he shall return. Now this will become important as time goes on. We had cracked the diplomatic code of the Japanese and that's why we knew there was going to be some type of an attack in late fall. We had also cracked the naval code of the Japanese and we discovered that the Japanese were going to make an attack on Midway. Now, the Hawaiian Islands stretch out for almost a thousand miles. And the northernmost island of the Hawaiian chain is called Midway. It is midway between Tokyo and San Francisco. And so the big flying boats would fly from San Francisco to Midway, refuel, and then fly from Midway to Tokyo, or vice versa, in the 1930s. From Midway, the Japanese could launch bomber attacks on Hawaii. If Hawaii was unattainable to the Americans, then all of the Pacific would fall into the hands of the Japanese. Since we knew the Japanese were going to attack Midway, and we had a pretty good idea of when they were going to attack Midway. This gave us an advantage. Now, four Japanese aircraft carriers, along with some of their support vessels, will be sunk in this battle. Now, the loss of American life is also quite extreme. But after Midway, the Japanese Navy is unable to protect the homeland. The Japanese Navy is unable to protect the soldiers who have already gone to various islands. <coughs> and so just as Normandy was the turning point of World War II in Europe, Midway is considered the turning point of the war in the Pacific. So here we go. Here is our map of the Pacific Ocean. Now, this would be Pearl Harbor. Midway would be right about there. So, we had, I believe, five different site numbers on our map of Europe. We're going to have about five different site numbers on our map of the Pacific. I had mentioned about Guam falling in December of 1941. I had mentioned about the Philippines falling in the spring of 1942. Well, we have stopped the Japanese advance. What next? The question became how to take back the Pacific and how to defeat the Japanese. Yes, ma'am? What year did Guam fall? 41. December of 41. Right around Christmas time. The question now becomes how do we take back the Pacific? How do we defeat the Japanese? Now remember, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill had made the statement during the Atlantic Charter it would be Europe first. So we are not going to get the same number of men, the same number of planes as we have in Europe. <coughs> so that may, make, that may challenge how we're going to win. To make matters even worse, there are two different ideas. Douglas MacArthur says, I think the way to win the war against the Japanese is to use Australia as a home base, first capture the Philippines, then capture China, then invade Japan. 
And that's what MacArthur says to Marshall. That's what MacArthur says to the President of the United States. But there's another player in this story. Chester Nimitz. Chester Nimitz is in charge of the Navy in the Pacific. Now remember, the Navy has its own ground troops. These are the U.S. Marines. If you become a member of the Marines, then you are becoming part of the U.S. Navy. Now, Nimitz's plan is different. Nimitz says we should capture the islands in the Central Pacific, the Guams, the Wakes, islands like this, and then use them as a launching pad to go and bomb Japan. Well, the president comes out to Hawaii in 1942, and Nimitz proposes his plan. MacArthur proposes his plan, and in true Franklin Roosevelt, he says, let's do both of them. Roosevelt proposes that there be a competition between the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy, that the Navy can do their central plan, the Army can do their Pacific, although the Navy will be responsible for helping out MacArthur when he makes the various landings. In 1942, MacArthur put his plan into effect on the Solomon Islands, which is now part of New Guinea. Now this is as far south as the Japanese had come. They were within about, I'd say, 800 miles of the northern part of Australia. The American Army, the American Navy, and the American Marines will stop the Japanese. Well, in 1943, the Army will start its plan, the Navy will start its plan. Now, if you have the pre-printed slides, I would put an N on this one to remind me that this is part of the Navy plan. The Navy is going to choose islands that are lightly defended. They're going to land on these islands that are lightly defended. They will then capture them and use the islands as a launching pad to bomb heavily defended islands into submission. The plan becomes known as Island Hoppy. So, you have several islands. You pick the one that is lightly defended and capture it. You then use your Air Force, your Navy Air Force, to bomb into submission the one that is heavily defended. After you have captured them all, you move on. Now, this picture here was taken at Tarawa. Now, if it could go wrong, it did go wrong at Tarawa for the U.S. Marines. Now, for those of you young men and women who decide that you're going to join the Marines, either after high school or college, the first couple of days is what's called indoctrination. And part of the indoctrination about what makes a Marine a Marine is the stories that you will hear about Tarawa. Again, the bravery of the American Marines is tested at Tarawa, but Tarawa is successful. In 1944, MacArthur captures the Philippines, so this would be an A slide, A for Army. Now, in this picture of MacArthur coming ashore, on the extreme left-hand part, that's the president of the Philippines. And he and MacArthur will say to the Filipinos, rally to the American army and help drive the Japanese out. 
Soon, the Philippines are in the hands of the Americans and Filipinos, and now it's on to China. In 1944, the Navy and the Marines capture Guam. Now, on Guam, they are within range of a new bomber. Now, bombers are always given the symbol B. So B would stand for bomber. The number 29 is just an identifying number. It was the 29th bomber proposed and accepted. The B-29 could fly to Japan and back. Now, the nice thing about the B-29 was it flew higher than the Japanese fighters could fly. So the only thing that could shoot it down would be artillery. So here again is our map of the Pacific Ocean. So let's see. We have Site 1, that's the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We have Site 2, that's where Midway is, that's where the Americans defeat the Japanese and that's the turning point of the war. We have Site 3, that's the Philippines. We have Site 4, that's Guam. Now, the idea behind the army is this. We start in Australia, we go through New Guinea. That's where, that's where Guadalcanal is. We go through the Philippines, we go through China, we attack Japan. The idea of Nimitz's plan is to start and go through the Central Pacific and attack Japan like this purple arrow. Now again, the Navy is succeeding, the Army is succeeding, let's let the contest continue. When Guam was taken, the United States Army Air Corps will appoint the man who's chomping on that big cigar. That is Curtis LeMay. Now, Curtis LeMay had risen in the ranks in Europe, and LeMay believed that if the B-29 dropped its bombs from 30,000 feet, that the bombs would scatter as they fall and wouldn't effectively destroy the Japanese. So LeMay suggested that maybe the bombers should go down to several thousand feet above the, of the, above the ground and drop incendiary bombs. Now an incendiary bomb is when it, when it hits the ground, it starts a fire. Now it uses magnesium, and because it uses magnesium, water won't put out the fire. And hundreds of thousands are going to die in Japanese cities because of these devastating fires. The B-29s were getting chewed up pretty good because of this philosophy. And so in the spring of 1945, the American Marines are asked to capture a small island called Iwo Jima. Now Iwo Jima is just a speck in the Pacific Ocean, but it's a big enough speck that if the B-29 was having trouble getting back to Guam, it could at least land and get repaired. On Iwo Jima, the American Army Air Corps could put fighters to go with our bombers to protect them from Japanese fighters. The battle for Iwo Jima is one of the most ferocious battles during World War II. Now, it was at Iwo Jima that the U.S. Marines unleashed the code talkers. What we discovered is that as, as our soldiers talk back and forth on the radio, or as they talk back and forth on landlines, the Japanese were listening in. And the Japanese would know if we were getting ready to attack, and they would leave 
and then come back and hit us at a time when we least expected it. Navajo Indians are taught a language that you can only learn on the reservation. So Navajo Indians were asked to join the Marines. There, they would talk to each other in Navajo. And this way, the Japanese could not understand what was going on. Maybe it would be better if one of the code talkers told you what he did. Over 200 Navajo code talkers participated on the landing of Iwo Jima. The 5th Marine Division were on the north side of the island. A couple of Marines were pinned down real badly. They were being fired upon from three different directions. Mortar shells were being dropped on. They were hovering desperately in a foxhole. Company commander wrote down a message asking for help, handed to a Navajo code talker. This is what the Navajo code talker said. This is the actual message that was sent on Ingo. The bed and now a cheap beat that is hardly dead last song slip, can't you drop chin? Think that time, car as time now keep shush. What does that mean? This is what he said in Navajo. Sheep, eyes, nose, deer, destroyer, tea, mouse, turkey, onion, sick horse, three, six, two, bear. As each Navajo word came through the air, the court talker down at the beach command post, he writes it down in English. What did he write down? Send. Demolition team to hill 362B. There were three hills on the north side, 362A, 362B, and 362C. Beneath 362B was the problem. This message took 20 seconds. After 20 seconds, beach command post organized a rescue team to save that company marines. If that message was sent in English code, it would have taken 30 minutes, 20 seconds in Navajo, 30 minutes in English code. Those guys pinned down on your side didn't have 30 minutes. Without Navajo, Marines would never have taken the island of Iwo Jima. That's how critical Navajo code was to the war in the Pacific. And we should never forget what war is. War is something that nobody wants. It's bad, it's okay. But so long as we are together, no matter what nationality you are, if you are American and love this country, we all have to stick together to keep this nation strong. Our freedom and liberty means so much meant so much for those who never made it home. So it's up to us now to keep this nation strong and prosperous. Now, as you heard from the Navajo Code Talker, you saw the American flag being raised over Mount Suribachi. Now, Mount Suribachi was the highest point on Iwo Jima, and somehow, some way, some guy in charge thought it would be a good idea to raise the American flag. So a group of Marines went to the top and they raised the American flag. Well, it was a small flag, and the commander said, raise a bigger flag. Well, six Marines were asked to go to the top and raise a bigger flag. This time, though, a member of Associated Press went with them and captured the most iconic image of World War II. You never get away from that feeling of grabbing for Mother Earth and that first feeling of, what am I doing here? 